Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to our um, continuing series of Nuffield videos. This is uh, the year of living vicariously, which means we can't be out traveling. So we're doing our best to get a little taste of what the world is like by interacting through our Zoom meetings with some of our global network. So as always, we um, have the ability to mute ourselves. So please, if you're not talking, please mute. But we're doing this as a Zoom meeting as opposed to a webinar. So you do have access to your uh, camera on and off buttons and also your uh, mute on and off buttons, please. So use those if you're not talking. We'll be using the chat function. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please uh, type it in the chat and the speakers will be able to answer those questions as we're going. And of course, we'll have time at the end as well. So this morning or this evening, wherever you are in the world, we'll be hearing from three speakers from the US. So I've titled this webinar, Droughts in Cali, Hurricanes in North California and an election looming. So we have three speakers, one from California talking about uh, weather and water and all things farming in Cali. We have a Nuffield scholar, 2018 scholar, Archie Griffin, who will be talking to us about farming in North Carolina. And then we have our chair of Nuffield International Farming Associates USA, which is quite a mouthful, um, Ed Key, who will be giving us a brief snapshot of what it looks like to have an, an election in America. And of course, that's next weekend. People are voting now and what that election might be looking like. Uh, but no predictions, no predictions, he tells me. So I'm gonna hand over now to our first speaker. I'm just sharing my screen here. And our first speaker is John Chandler from Selma in California, who's a partner in Chandler Farms. Thank you, John. Very good. Can you hear me? Uh, hello. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, thanks, John. All right. Perfect. Um, so, yes, uh, as Jody said, my name is John Chandler. Uh, I'm a grower here in California, part of a, a family farm. Uh, just a little bit of background about me. Uh, having grown up on the farm here uh, just outside of Fresno. Uh, it's, uh, it was something I always wanted to do, but I did take a brief uh, uh, kind of a side, side tour after I graduated college and ended up doing agricultural policy, both water policy and ag policy for the state of California. Uh, where I worked for, it was called the Association of California Water Agencies uh, for a number of years uh, going through water policy. And then I also worked in uh, the California State Senate um, as a staff for their Committee on Agriculture, dealing with all ag policy issues that went through the Senate. Uh, but about uh, eight years ago, I was called back to the farm and I've been working on the, uh, the farm ever since. Now let's see if I can get this thing to work here. Oh, did I, oh, no, looks like I hit the wrong button. Forgive me here. So here's for those of you, this is California and where I'm located is right there where the arrow is, uh, that's just south of Fresno. Uh, now this part of the, the state of California is known as the Central San Joaquin Valley. And the Central San Joaquin Valley is uh, really the agricultural engine for California. And California is uh, the largest agricultural producing state in the United States. It would be safe to say that out of the central San Joaquin Valley, if you ever traveled through the United States, every meal that you eat, there's something on that plate that came from within the central San Joaquin Valley throughout your entire stay, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so it, it is quite a strong agricultural area. Now, the, the family farm, uh, we've been here since uh, the late 1800s, and this is a picture of home place here just outside of Fresno uh, near a town called Selma and uh, it was founded by my great-grandfather who came here from uh, Illinois and uh, we've grown uh, typically a lot of uh, 
uh, vineyards here was the big crop. They used to do wheat in this region. And then later we would start to do uh, some packing. And this is from the 1917, we used to run a packing house that would pack uh, Malaga grapes that would be shipped all over the country. Um, and then as automation would come in, you can see there's some uh, you know, tractors and, and family members. And our evolved, so we moved from away from a lot of the, uh, the, the dry land farming and vines. And as we got more water, we'd start doing more uh, tree crops and higher value crops. Here's the farm uh, probably about in the 1990s. Uh, you can see that the landscape has changed significantly from the earlier picture I showed. There's a lot more trees out there, still some vines, uh, but the trees are, are really starting to be uh, uh, more prevalent. And uh, from there, here's a, a picture of the family uh, that we, I farm with my father and brother. And there's my brother's um, kids and his wife and my mother and father are both as well. We, up until this year, uh, we farmed peaches and plums and uh, nectarines and stone fruit. Um, but labor and other, other cost uh, restraints really drove us uh, out of that market. And so as the nature with all agriculture, we're constantly evolving. So we're, we've moved away and removed or just pulled out all of our stone fruit after this year's harvest. So it's kind of sad, uh, but we do still have some vineyards here. We're harvesting some raisin grapes. It's a lot of mechanical labor is a very big issue for California. We're always short of labor and the cost of labor is a, is a strong constraint when it comes towards being profitable as a farm. And the big crop in California right now is almonds. Here we are harvesting some almonds. Um, it, it, not only is it uh, very portable globally, and it's very desirable globally, the price is very good, the, the rate of return is very good, but it's also very much mechanized, so you can farm a lot of acres with fewer people, as opposed to stone fruit and some uh, vines, which you farm a little acres with a lot of people. And so agriculture in California is changing and it's slowly moving more towards mechanization as it can. Uh, we also farm citrus. You know, these are some uh, mandarins, They're, these are called tangos. Uh, and when the easy peel mandarins became very popular in the United States and globally, it really took off here. And so we started planting some citrus. Here's a new uh, citrus orchard being planted. And as you can see, water and irrigation systems are very important. We're installing an irrigation system. Uh, normally we'd try and install this, all this irrigation system before planting, uh, but we, time constraints we had to plant first so we were working around all the trees here and we have had a lot of guys out there laying pipe uh, as i said we, labor is a big thing here's here's all our workers they're very big very important part uh, of our farm so i wanted to make sure and show that to you as well um, now i'd like to really get into uh, some of the more meteor issues for california and let's literally dip into water um, you know, I kind of talked a little bit during the history of the farm how labor has been such a, uh, a key issue, but what really is a key issue is water in California. And it has ever since people started coming here when they were panning for gold, when they started growing crops, uh, really things were driven by water. There's actually a really fun story that uh, in this part of the country, uh, when they were scouting along the, uh, uh, the valley, looking at where they would lay the railroad, because that's really when you would start to uh, really settle areas as the railroad would show up. Uh, the, the gentleman that was out looking for the railroad uh, came along and he saw this one field that was just green, surrounded by all this brown uh, grass. And he says, what's going on here? And he found out that they were growing wheat and that it was growing there because they were able to get water on it. And it was kind of like a light bulb went off and said, if you can get water on things in this valley, you can really grow and make uh, farming viable. And that's really been the story of California agriculture in general. And as a result, you can see on this picture, this is a picture of all the different state, federal and local water projects that have occurred in California. And it, this is just the water projects. And so you can really see they've created kind of the arteries of the state. And if you remember anything from this talk, when it comes to California water, the important key is to remember is that water in California is typically from the northern part of the state, but the high demand for water is all in the southern part of the state. 
And so you'll see a lot of these lines that are all canals and conveyance systems for water are all moving north south, bringing the water from the north and moving it to the south. Now, this doesn't really reflect all of the nuances of the whole system, but it does give you an idea of the scale of what we're talking about. And each of these feed large communities from agricultural communities uh, as the largest area, but really the biggest users would be in the southern part of the state, uh, which where you can see a lot of lines moving down into that southern part. And that's the Los Angeles basin. And you also have it leading down into San Diego. And so that's really a big part of the water conversation is the ag and urban interface. And that's really evolved again, come the um, early nineties and then through the two thousands, when you start adding the environmental demands on water. And so all of those interests are all flexing around how we utilize this system, how much water we're gonna be allowing to move through these conveyance systems, how much is being sent out to the wildlife and how much goes to ag and how much goes to urban. So to give you an idea of what we're looking at, a couple of those lines on there were the California Aqueduct and the uh, Delta Mendota Canal. The California Aqueduct was a state water project. So the state of California on its own says water is so important, we need to move this water around. They built a massive canal that took water from the northern part of the state all the way down to the southern part of the state in Los Angeles. And all along the way, it's peeling off and, and feeding water into, um, into the agricultural lands around the central San Joaquin Valley. and really took ground that was scrub brush that you would see on this picture kind of on to the, uh, the, the right side that was all uh, not very irrigated and started turning it green by allowing the productivity and agriculture to grow. And so you can see what really is happening when you add water to California and, that, and why it's such a critical element. Now you have these two canals right next to each other because the one on the right is the California Aqueduct and the one on the left is the Delta Mendota Canal. The Delta Mendota Canal was built by the federal government and that goes mainly for agriculture, but they move almost parallel to each other and they're feeding a lot of the same regions along the way, now, but there's different rights that come with it. So some people that pull water from the Delta Mendota Canal may get more water than they would get if they, were, if they had other land that was taking water from the California Aqueduct. And so that becomes one of the aspects of California water conversations is what is your right to water and where do you sit on the hierarchy of rights? Do you get water first or do you get water last? And that really dictates the success, failure, and what kind of crops you can grow on your property. Now, California, everyone kind of talked about during the uh, you know, 2010 all the way through 2016 about the drought. And this is a dam that's just above our uh, where we farm. We don't really pull off of this dam, but it's very close to us. And it kind of shows you the scale of what we were talking about with the drought. And you can see 2011, how the, the reservoir was completely full and in 2014, the reservoir is completely empty. And that really kind of shows the, the, what we were talking about when, when people would say, hey, we've had a drought in California and had very significant effects. And for agriculture, what that really meant is for, for much of us, we rely on that surface water that would be conveyed to us through all those canals that were in that earlier map to provide us with the, the water necessary to grow. And in, the, in this kind of drought situation, that water is just simply not available. And so what happened is a lot of agriculture turned to their groundwater. And so we, we, we don't always get water, even during flush years, we don't get water all year round it's really seasonal and you're trying to deliver it during the most necessary times of the summer when you're growing your crops. And so to fill in those times when you don't get surface water, everyone has groundwater wells. And so every, all the farmers started turning to their wells and they're pumping and, and because the crops that we have, trees, unlike uh, vegetable crops and unlike the wheat, uh, those stay in the ground year round. And so we had to keep water on them to keep them alive and keep going. Um, and almonds in particular are very sensitive to drought. If you, if you uh, hold back water from them on one year, they will, uh, they will suffer for multiple years afterwards. And so we started pumping a lot and that created a whole nother problem 
And in this picture, you can kind of see there's a lot going on, but you'll see these red areas. And this shows the fall in the groundwater levels throughout the state. And the red means it fell uh, uh, more than 100 feet. Uh, and the others show uh, uh, other drops in water level. And so what happened with the groundwater levels falling, it was the most we've really ever pumped out of that system in history. And so we started seeing a new problem arise where wells that had been good for 60, 80 years, all of a sudden started going dry because the, the wells weren't deep enough. And, and particularly in the, my part of the central San Joaquin Valley, which has historically always had good groundwater, our groundwater started dropping. We had it normally 40 feet down, it would drop to 80 feet down. And so farmers started calling up well drillers to say, hey, my well went dry. I need to get water in my crops. You need to come out and drill a new well right away. And so the price of drilling a well went way up. The availability to drill a well was very scarce and it became a big problem. Then you compound on that the impact uh, to small communities in, uh, in the region that may have been relying on wells that went dry. And that created a huge uh, you know, political firestorm over what's going on with this groundwater, which was directly related to the drought and the shortage of our surface water that we couldn't supplement. And so, we, so California started implementing this new process, it's called the State Groundwater Management Act, that we're looking at finally having some sort of rules that would govern how we deal with groundwater. And associated with that huge drop in groundwater would be subsidence. This here is a picture that was from the USGS, the United States Geological Service, where this lady here is standing with these different dates. And those dates show where the ground used to be. So subsidence really works that as you start pumping a lot of water out of the ground, what was typically held up by the hydraulic pressure of the water underground, it would fill all the orifices of a clay. As you pull that water out, the clay starts compacting and the ground starts to sink. And that's where you get this subsidence. And subsidence really causes a lot of problems as you go through the whole, uh, whole system of, uh, of roads and infrastructure uh, for, for the region. And one, one particular area is we have some major canals that have lost up to 40% of their capacity permanently because of subsidence as parts of the canal drop uh, in certain regions that may not have had a lot of water and over pump um, their groundwater that uh, we have this as a, as, a, as a problem that comes along and is, is we're working very hard trying to find solutions to fix those canals and, and manage our water better to reduce, subs reduce the subsidence problem. Um, it, this is an older picture just kind of showing that you know, water in California was always very important and um, you know, sometimes we'd horse around with it as well. Um, so lastly, I just want to know if there's any questions about California water, California agriculture, the family farm, or anything that uh, you folks might have a question about. Thank you, John. So if anyone has a question, please type it in the chat box or put on your video and unmute. Great. We'll have time for questions at the end as well. Okay. So thank you very much, John. That's excellent. Some amazing pictures there, both of the aquifers, the aqueducts, sorry, and uh, that subsidence. Yeah, that's when you see something as, as uh, what do they say? A picture tells a thousand words. It's really quite interesting. So Archie, I might hand over to you now, if I could. You're on mute, Archie. Thank you. All right, sorry, I had it, on, had it muted. Uh, can everybody see that? Yes, thumbs up. All right, thanks, Brian. Um, so, John, I, I don't know how I'm going to really be able to follow that uh, incredible slideshow and, and talk because that was top notch. Um, but I will talk a little bit about my GFP and my, my study as well as how it's helped, um, I guess, change our farm because we have been dealing with so many hurricanes. Um, 
so I live in Eastern North Carolina, which is uh, on the very far Eastern part of the U S um, I don't have a picture of that, but it's think about the furthest part, uh, part East in the U S um, I mean, we are roughly one hour from the coast and uh so we are, we take the blunt of every single hurricane that comes in um, in this area. Hurricanes have become a big deal in recent years because of, um, and I'm going to say it, uh, even though most Americans don't really share the same thing, but it's uh, I think the climate change has, has impacted it. Um, we have seen an increase in storms and in our low-lying areas, uh, the soil is very high in organic matter, and when we get hurricanes coming in, they generously or typically drop generous amounts of water um, and rainfall, and as well as high winds. Uh, the closest thing I could pair it to in Australia, it would be something like a cyclone, um, which just call it a different name. Um, generally with these hurricanes, we see winds up to a hundred and some miles an hour, um, rainfall anywhere from uh, 10 to 30 plus inches of rain, um, which is, excuse me, I don't know the, the, the change, um, but for us and our crops, it is very tough. Uh, to, dig, to give you a little background on myself, I did not plan on coming back to the farm. I uh, came back roughly 10 years ago uh, after my father um, talking to me and, and kind of showing me as an only child, it was kind of, he gave it to me and he said, you can either come back or I can sell everything. So I made the ultimate decision to come back and farm. Our farm, we grow primarily corn, wheat, soybeans and tobacco, as well as industrial hemp, uh, sweet corn. And now we are, we are moving in the direction of the farm to table and um, local grocery stores. We predominantly farm, let's say tobacco is our cash crop. Um, while it only amounts for 20% of our acreage, it amounts for 85 to 90% of our total gross income. Um, it is a cash crop through and through. The rest of it is soybeans, wheat, or corn. Now, tobacco is a very, what's the right word I'm looking for, but it's a confrontational crop. Um, but it is a heritage that we have grown and that we continue with. Uh, tobacco in our areas, our soil is, is made for it. it we, there's a reason why North Carolina grows some of the best in the world. And it's the reason why we continue to strive for it because it, it produces such high gross income. Um, but as, you, as you've seen over the years from attacks from health organizations and all around the world, tobacco has become a target. Um, there's a reason why, you know, I think I saw a figure when we were on our GFP that 75% of discretionary income is spent towards tobacco or alcohol. Um, and we, while well, I see that it is a problem and issue crop, we're here at the end of the day to, to make sure our, our farm continues into the future. But because we have seen such blowback and such negative publicity on the tobacco, we have been looking for ways that we can survive without that. Um, the hurricanes, when they come in as of the, on the tobacco, it creates a lot of uh, wind that speeds up the ethylene production in the crops. Um, so with the tobacco, the negative publicity and the, the increase in the hurricane amounts, we kind of looked for different ways that we can transition taking upon the trends that are going on around the world, not only here in, in North Carolina, but around the world. Um, let's see if I can, oh. uh, my research topic was talking about the transformational ways of how agriculture is planted, cultivated and harvested. Um, 
and determine the optimal pathway for farmers facing uncertainty in the future of their historical main crops. What I found was efficiency technology and differentiation really paved the way for going forward in the future. Um, in Israel, I noticed that they they kind of had three words that really described it was, and that was adapt, innovate, and overcome. They were basically growing in a in a desert similar to California, but they made ways to bring topsoil in and grow in that area, um, mostly predominantly under hoop houses or greenhouses, um, and they would even take the soil from low-lying productive areas and put it on trucks and ship it to somewhere else. Um, and they also started doing with, uh, dealing with um, aeroponics, I guess you could say, uh, instead of hydroponics. Um, Ophira Langer, even though I don't know the first thing about dairy, um, this gentleman was the most interesting person I've ever talked to. Um, and he said the efficiency is most important aspect of agricultural production. Yes, technology is expensive, but is a vital component to maximizing efficiency. Um, in Zimbabwe and Zambia, they, while they don't deal with a lot of hurricanes, they dealt with a lot of the challenges that we had. And that was the access to funds, profit margins are slim or cease to exist. And a gentleman I visited there, he suggested that he follows um, three different steps to overcome his challenges, and that is adapt, adjust, and then execute his plan. Uh, technology and differentiation. Going forward in in the U.S. agriculture and specifically in North Carolina and in our farm, we are trying to adapt more of a uh, and implement more of a 360 degree circle of sustainability um, or a circular economy uh, where we limit every little waste that we can and limit um, the budget line items. So that's, uh, you know, recycling uh, fodder that would normally be left on the field or chafe that would be normally left on the field and using that in anaerobic digestion or recycling waste that would normally be taken to a landfill to produce energy to heat the rest of our, um, our operations. Uh, we're looking at a number of different things. Um, but the, the differentiation part is we have focused more on, in the past, our farm has always farmed a commodity. Um, and we've always been subject to the what happens in the commodity um, and those those prices are on a global scale and they they have so many fundamentals that impact them that we that were out of our control but the one um thing that we we feel is that we can control and, and target is people um so our farm is kind of taking a transition to start farming the people instead of act, the actual crop um, and I remember my father used to always say, and, and he said this, you know, one time, but I don't think he even meant it um, in, in regards to the farm. But, you know, the, those that refute change will ultimately succumb to the mercy of those embracing it. Um, and when I when I talk about a 180 degree production cycle, it's you know, most farmers have always been on that. They believe that. Uh, inputs and outputs are the only thing that are on the spectrum. Um, they believe that, you know, the higher your inputs go, generally equal higher yields, which equal higher profits. Um, and that's, I'm not saying that that's wrong, but I'm saying that generally farmers in the U.S. have been duped into believing that the more you pump into something, um, the higher yields you get, the higher profits you'll get. And the higher yields in general generally means higher profits. Um, but we're we're transitioning to and trying to make a name and, and transition to a 360 degree production cycle aimed at the maximizing efficiency 
and minimalizing and recycling inputs and waste. Um, but there's one thing that you have to remember, you know, farming is easy and anyone can farm, but not everyone can make money and be sustainable and, and continue year after year. When I talk about a circular economy, um, the diagram in front of the, uh, in front of you shows a linear economy, a reuse economy, and a circular economy. In a linear economy, the raw materials uh, are then used for for production and then used to make a product, and then you have you end up with non-recyclable waste. In a reuse economy, which is generally what what we are at now, your raw materials like fertilizer and seed are used to produce a crop. In that crop, you have your fodder or your chafe, but nothing else. Um, you don't recycle any waste, any bad crop. Um, and, and, and on our farm, if it's a bad crop, we just disc it under. We don't send it back into production. In a circular economy, it's a giant circle, a 360 degree production, that everything is recycled, everything's used, um, and there's it minimizes all uh, escapes. If you, when we were deciding to make changes to our farm, we looked at the gardener hype cycle. Um, and if, and that basically is, is Moore's law says that as technology increases, it will out, outpace, um, technology outpaces its production cycle. So every day is something new comes up. Um, if you look at robotic tractors, uh, the hype of it is much higher than, than what it currently is. Um, drones, when, when drones were first introduced, everybody thought that, oh, well, you know, drones will be spraying with drones in, in one to two years and, and everybody's gonna go to, um, you know, unmanned vehicles to operate and, and apply uh, chemicals. Well, as you can see, that did not come out. Um, that, that those expectations peaked, but they never really came to uh, fruition. And that sends it to a trough of delusionment. Um, your genetically modified seeds now are almost where we're at is it's there they're reaching their plateau they there is really not that much more optimism for them their expectations are, are much lower now there there might be some some changes but how they affect and and how the at the end of the day those seeds they don't protect us from uh, storms or hurricanes or anything. There's really nothing that we can do when it comes to nature. Um, there's nothing that we can do that we can control when it comes to nature. Uh, if you look at the least expensive technology for general generating electricity by county across the U S uh, you generally see in the Midwest, uh, a wind, um, and, a few bit of solar, a little bit of solar. In North Carolina, on your far right hand side, you see a lot of solar. Um, solar here is, has been increasing, increasing over years. And it's something that is taking up farmland that, you know, is, is used to grow our crops. In North Beaufort County, where I live, we are the highest producing, um, highest producer of soybeans and corn in the entire state. So when those solar plants come in, generally they, they take up valuable farmland. Um, and, and our plan on the farm was how do we mitigate that? How do we keep our farmland but not fall victim to your, your hurricanes and, and um, your land being taken from uh, solar plants? Uh, it's my belief that, uh, energy, while it will be good, um, it, it's not right there. Uh, this was a, an article from Scientific American where, um, it detailed 
about how electricity and solar is is and energy is is just on the cusp but the technology there to sustain and store that energy is not there um so i think that's where every, everything's going forward towards in the future um oh this was a good one uh somewhere in the world right now someone is complaining that gmos are unnatural while eating seedless grapes um i always get a kick out of that but i'll let you take that as you want it so as we started changing our farm and thinking about where we were going to take our farm we started considering um you know the three layers layer model of competition which was uh, your reputation your distinguishing features and your commodity or your brand driven pair features and price is how they distinguish in many industries uh your reputation is based off extreme loyalty um but in most industries you distinguish distinguishing features are where the battles are fought and where all the money is made your commodities is where the price wars happen that's what we do currently growing grains and mixed grains and, and commodities that's we're at a price war um it's when we're competing across a global scale it's generally whoever has the cheapest crop is where people will buy and that's where we wanted to get out of um in let's see here this is where sorry this is the first time i've seen this in a while and uh i didn't know exactly this one was on here <laughs> what we wanted to do with um with our commodity uh crop in our farm is transition from the commodities into this distinguishing features and how do we do that is by pertaining to people's trends and their likes um and and not only just farming the crop but farming the people so we did that through innovation um, but over time all distinguishing features that matter to your customers will become part of the commodity level offering basically in other words they become a basis of the competition um, because what we do on our farm can be copied um, so it's it's a it's a transition that is very challenging and you have to constantly be in it innovating uh like i said no good idea goes uncopied uh let's see here take a quick look at the u.s wine snapshot um it's third largest aggregate consumption of wine 31st per capita and holding um, a 20 billion dollar industry california wines had two-thirds of the market share unit sales competition from all over the globe industry is consolidating top producers or top eight producers produce at 75 percent it's it is intense competition and pressure on prices this is where we really started to apply our farm and we call it the the business competitive strategy canvas um you know most farms have uh your price your ideological terminology and distinctions uh your aging quality above the the line marketing vineyard prestige your wine complexity and wine range um what we what yellowtail take take for example yellowtail did is they dropped and, and eliminated the aging quality and above the line marketing they didn't they didn't do that your vineyard prestige they raised that up and started taking people into the actual grocery stores and dressing up as uh, individuals from the outback um and people like that that pertained to them their senses because they thought that they were getting a taste of australia little did they know it was dirt cheap wine it was awful but it was still entertain their senses um you they created a an ease of selection and fun and adventure uh and that's what we're trying to do with our farm going forward um and what we see today is 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 farms going forward in the future 
is moving towards more vertical farming um, and pertaining to the people instead of just the commodity, kind of erasing that uh, middleman, um, the commodity brokers, and going that route. Uh, one thing that we use is a blue ocean strategy. Um, and that is do not take industry conditions as given. Reshape them in your favor and do not seek to beat the competition. Focus on creating and capturing good and band and pursue differentiation and low cost. If you don't know what a red ocean or blue ocean strategy is, I highly encourage you to, to look at it because it changed the way we thought of our farm. Um, Moving on from, from that, I know I've bounced around a lot. Uh, sorry, I apologize. My ADD has kicked in. Um, but Nuffield gives you wings. It, it gives you a chance to kind of branch out and, and view things from a 30,000 foot perspective. Um, if I did not have, if, if I had not participated in the Nuffield program, I don't know that we would be where we are uh, with, with four or five years back to back of hurricanes that have come through and beaten the crop and you've, we've lost um, tremendous amounts, close to 75% of the tobacco crop, our, our cash crop. We would, I don't, I, I hate to say it, but I, I wonder if we would even be here. Um, when you have a hurricane that comes through and they, they drop torrentious amounts of rain and bring in torrential uh, winds and, and spur up uh, tornadoes in this past hurricane, we had, uh, I think there was 35 uh, tornadoes that spurred up in, in you know, within a, a 30 mile radius. Uh, when, when you have something like that, it can be totally devastating to a crop and, and be gone within minutes, um, as well as your entire livelihood, your entire farm, not just your crop. So it's, it's things like that. We're not in, in the business to be insurance farmers. Uh, the, in, as you see across the world, and I, I might, don't quote me on this, but I think, the U.S. is one of the only countries that has insurance for, for agricultural production. And in my view, it's only a matter of time before that is eliminated. Um, because the way politics is going, there are a lot of people moving towards that route. Uh, we as a farm, we need to make changes to our operation to ensure that, that we are on the, on the cutting edge of that. Um, because if a storm was to come through, let's see, in the past, past 10 years, I believe we've had a, a hurricane come through eight out of 10, so to say. And it's for a storm to come through like that and wipe out our entire crop in our entire year, when we are a month or two away from harvest, it's devastating. It has a mental impact um, and it can be not only devastating to your crop and your mental capacity, but it can be devastating to your livelihood and, and going forward in the future. Um, it's something that is, it's very challenging. So that's why we've, we've made changes to start targeting the farms or the, the people instead of just the commodity. Uh, we've enacted a farm to table restaurant. We've brought in a brewery. Uh, we have um, brought in a, uh, a preschool to kind of help attract the parents so that the parents can not only get the, the kids there, but, but they can get their, their produce and they can get a beer while doing it, or they can allow their children to, to play around while they drop, uh, get a beer. Um, so it's really of it's really that mentality of creating a Walmart, so to say, in the agriculture community. Um, not only to give them all different options, but to give them a a chance to relax and you know 
something they can come and enjoy and do everything together there at once. Um, let's see here. The pathway from my tech, uh, my scholarship, I determined that the pathway of efficiency, technology, and differentiation led me to believe that food and energy are the two most important commodities to individuals around the world. Um, and that's where what we have done is, is pertain to those two. Um, we're in the process of putting together a uh, anaerobic digester on the farm to take all the yeast and everything from the uh, brewery um, and all the wasted food. So it's, it, you really have to look at a 30,000 foot perspective and apply efficiency technology and differentiation to create a synergetic food and energy industry um, on your own little farm. And with that, uh, I will say that, you know, it's only after you've stepped outside of your comfort zone that you begin to change, grow and transform. And with that, if there's any questions, I'll gladly take them. Thanks very much, Chi. Uh, I appreciate it. it's been a long day for you and I really appreciate you doing this for us. It's great to hear what you've been up to in the last little while. Certainly been busy by the sound of it. Yeah, and sorry it's been all over the place. Uh, yeah, I did not, I was not prepared for, uh, to pr do present presentation, but I saw when John, uh, after John's presentation, I had to kind of step up to the plate all of a sudden. <laughs> you did admirably, like a true Nuffield scholar can, step up to the plate at any time. Um, we've had some questions come through the chat and, and John's been answering um, as we go. So um, we might yeah, move I, straight into Ed. Um, yeah. And yeah, please type in some questions as we go if anybody's got any. And Ed, if you'd like to start with your um, summary of the US election, please. I'll be glad to. Thank you, Ken. Am I unmuted? Um, you My are, button. we can hear you. Okay, and yep. then I'll click on that and click on this. And so I have five slides, six slides. I don't know where they went. Uh, let's see. Uh, you've got, you'll have to click backwards, I think, Ed, because you're at the oh, end of your slide yeah. chip. So you'll need to. I don't know How about that. Let me, yep. there. Thank you, Jody. So real quickly, and as Jody said earlier, we're one week away from our election day, but um, uh, pre-election voting has uh, broken all records this year. A lot of the states implemented rules to allow uh, uh, voting early uh, because of the pandemic. So people didn't want to wait in lines at vote, voting places. And so the last number I heard last night, over 60 million Americans have already voted. Now that's all under lock and key. We don't know how it turns out, but uh, that's a very, very all time high. So just, it's, we have a unique and quirky process for electing our president. And this is only about electing our, our president. If you go back to the last election, 2016, Hillary Clinton actually got more votes from the people, they call that popular vote, than Donald Trump by about 3 million uh, more votes. So how did Trump win? It's a system we have here called the Electoral College. And there are a total of 538 electors and they are derived from each state. I'll, I'll explain that a little more, but the number of electors in each state uh, is dependent upon or reflects the uh, congressional representation with one vote for each senator and a vote for each congressman in from a particular state in the House of Representatives. So this goes back to 1787 when we when Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and others wrote the Constitution and it was an, uh, the electoral college is a compromise between totally relying on the popular vote 
or the other method they talked about was just letting the Congress elect the president. So just to illustrate that a little better, across the country, there are 538 elect electors or 538 electoral votes. The smaller states, the minimum any state can have is three, um, and Delaware is one of those states. Washington, D.C. is not a state, but they get three electors. So each of our states, all 50 states, each has two senators, but the number of congressmen is dependent upon the population. Senators are elected for six years, congressmen are elected for two years. So for example, Delaware has three electoral votes, our two senators and just one congressman. Where John lives in California, uh, California has 55 electoral votes, two senators and 53 congressmen. So those electors are obligated to vote for the presidential candidate that won in each state. So if my state went Democratic for the president, I would be, if I were an elector, I'd be obligated to vote for the Democratic candidate. If my state voted uh, the majority for a Republican candidate, the elector is obligated to vote for that. You need 270 votes to win. The electors, there's a formula the Monday after the second Wednesday in December. So on December 14th in every state, there will be a little convention of these electors in each state and they will formally cast their ballots and the results will be then sent uh, to Washington. So this is just a map of the electoral college results in 2016. The red is Donald Trump, the blue is Hillary Clinton. And you can see that uh, uh, Donald Trump was able to amass victory in a lot of the quote, red states. And there's all kinds of political theories and demographics and analysis within each state as to why that happened. And especially the demographics, you know, women versus men, age groups, race, ethnicity, uh, income level, all of that analysis to try to determine, um, you know, how those votes, how voters uh, tend to cast their ballots. So as of um, last Friday, just this past Friday, an analysis of probably 11 polls reported in the New York Times, and these are different polling organizations, they are predicting that Joe Biden will win 49% of the popular vote. But remember, the Electoral College actually elects the president and they need 270 votes. Votes between Biden and Trump will be very, very close in what we just call swing states or close states. And you know the swing states can vary from year to year depending on who the candidates are. But those states listed, you can see the number of electoral votes they have. Uh, Florida is one of the bigger ones in Texas. And um, so those, we just don't know um, how those um, states will vote for either Trump or Biden. In 2016, it was somewhat of a surprise that Trump won in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Florida. Um, and that's what, those are some of the states that put him over the top. So one more slide. Um, again, polling data looking more closely at the states. You can see on the left, the blue uh, Biden, and on the right, the red for Trump. The polling analysis says there's 169 states they predict will be solid for Biden and for Trump, um, sol 101 solid for Trump. And then a little less um, sure, they call that likely for Biden, 47, 11 for Trump, and leaning for Biden, which is even shakier in the prediction, 32 for Biden and 13 for Trump. The key point here is there are 165 electoral votes that are just seen right now as a total toss-up. Toss so um, a week from today at this time, 
uh, I'll be turning on the TV to begin to uh, see the results. They really don't release them until the polls are closed in the different states. Um, um, and um, no predictions from me. Anything can happen in this election. I will conclude by saying this has been the most polarized and um, tension-filled election in my lifetime, and I'm 69 years old. So with that, Jody, I'll flip it back to you and try to answer any questions if there are any. So let's see. Uh, Thank you, Ed. You're welcome. It is You're certainly uh, from, from someone looking from the outside uh, in, it's a complicated process, but I understand um, with your little bit of history there, how uh, it's, it's was set that way back in um, the, the last century and, and the reasonings behind it, I guess. Yeah, but yeah. we're on a knife edge, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, I can't figure out how to close the PowerPoint. I can do that for you. Okay, thank you. There you go. Thank you. So uh, John and Archie have been answering questions in the chat as we go. Um, but please, if anyone's got a question for any of our presenters this morning, John, Archie or Ed, please uh, put your hand up. You'll have to turn your video on, obviously, to do that. And we do have a little bit of time for some questions. Bernie? You had a question? Yeah, thanks, Jody. Um, questions to John. Um, John, do you envisage that there's just going to be further and further regulation on the amount of extraction that, that farmers can take out of um, the aquifers? And you know, where do you see where do you see, I guess, the landscape being in sort of 10 years' time? Um, yeah, for for what we're allowed to take out of aquifers, that's actually been the, the huge battle that we've been fighting in California for a long time is just that determination. Um, you know, there, in California, I don't know if, if it's as prevalent in other parts of the world. In California, there's an old saying that um, is usually attributed to Mark Twain, uh, a, a great novelist and a satirist, uh, where you know, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. Um, and that kind of goes way back uh, when, and so it's really not gotten any better. It's actually gotten worse um, just because there's more poles on the water. And, and so we are seeing right now is uh, that, that water war is intensifying. Now with on our district alone, as an example, uh, it's not necessarily that it's being regulated out yet, but it's, we're, we're kind of hemmed in. We've really utilized every drop and so there's, there's districts, water districts downstream from where we are that are using the legal system to try and access more water, so, you know, you arguing over efficiency of use. Thanks, John. We, we have a question, um, Ed, for you. Teresa from the UK has asked, is, is there an advantage or disadvantage of Biden versus Trump for agriculture. And there is a second uh, question, who do you want to win? The three of you, but I'm not sure if you're gonna go there. I, well, let's, I'll just say that Biden is from the great state of Delaware and I've known him since 1972, but do not conclude one way or the other as to what I'm gonna do in the voting booth. That's a mystery, that's my secret. Um, I should really let John and Archie but answer that because they are the farmers. But my sense from talking to farmers across the country the past year, some farmers believe that um, Biden will be better and, and, um, and other farmers believe that Trump will. And we could get into a lot of nuances. I'll just conclude my observation in Iowa which exports a lot of corn, soybeans, and pork to China. When the trade war, so-called trade war started with China, 
those farmers said, you know what? We will take a hit for a while because China needs to learn a lesson. And yet in the last three or four months, um, because China is ramping up their pork production, they're buying tremendous amounts of soybeans. So it's all over the board. It, it's, um, um, uh, John, you have any thoughts or insights for her? Uh, well, I mean, when it comes down to uh, you know Trump and Biden, it, you know, you, you gave you very, gave a very diplomatic answer, and I think that that it's very accurate in the sense that, uh, as you said earlier, this is the most polarized election, and I think that's driving a lot of a, a lot of rhetoric on both sides that kind of has muddied the water for a lot of folks when you try and evaluate um, your decision based on the hard issues, and. You know, in the long run, you know, from California standpoint, California is a very left-leaning state, and we deal on agriculture-wise, we deal with a lot of a regulatory oversight from the state. Um, and I think, by and large, most of the growers that I talk to here uh, really chafe at that, and they really chafe at it based on their experience, and 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 that's something that I think they're very much opposed to and, and leans them more away from Biden and the Camilla Harris because her, her having uh, been exposed through being California senator, they say, well, if that's the direction it is planning on going, they're not sure if they want to follow that route. Of course, there are always folks that have the other opinion. So it's really all over the map, but uh, there, there's definitely a, a strong undercurrent away from anyone that would create more of a regulatory burden. John, I would I would definitely agree with that, um, especially here in North Carolina. It's uh, when I look at politics from an agriculture standpoint, it is very much a, a purple. Um, it's where it's a mixture of blue and red. Um, you have those people on the side that that believe that there's an overregulation um, in the policies. That there's an increase of of policy making that is unsatisfactory and, and does not go to help farmers. It only creates more burden. Um, and then you've got the other side that's saying, you know, more policy is the way and we need to, to change to meet the future. Um, what I have predominantly seen in your urban areas is more of a Biden-Harris uh, uh, fan. And then in your, your rural areas, you see more Trump. Um, and that it's kind of amazing to see how different areas of the, of the US uh, support different sides. Um, there was a big Netflix um, documentary, The Social Dilemma, about what you, what you see is pertaining to what everybody else in the area that, that you, you live in, what they research and, and what they look at. Um, so it's a, I don't know that either side would be beneficial or, or uh, negative in, in, in to, to say. Um, I do know that I look at it from a standpoint that if the U.S. economy goes down, generally the, the agriculture industry goes up um, because it makes us more competitive on a global scale. And when it comes down to, to, agriculture in, in the US, we are our major exporters around the world. And that's what it boils down to. Uh, if we're not competitive, then, you know, there's really nothing we can do. And our farms suffer. So I won't say which side I'm on. Um, I'll leave that for y'all to, to guess. I will say there was a lot of blue in that, uh, a lot of blue in that presentation, Ed. <laughs> I, I, we can't hear you, Ed. Ed, Ed, you're on mute there. Thank you. Um, let me make one important point about the question or to the question. Basically, would one candidate or the other favor agriculture? When, when, and I've hosted the GFP groups as they come through Washington, D.C., for five or six years now. And our goal is to give all of you the sense that 
we visit the executive branch. So that's whoever is in the presidency and, and visit the Department of Agriculture. Then we go up on Capitol Hill, where there's a whole mix of Republican and Democrats. And then there is an incredibly uh, strong and numerous agricultural lobby in Washington, D.C., with offices, with people, professional lobbyists that are calling on all the elected people and appointed people all day long. So those lobbyists represent national farm organizations. They represent commodity groups. They represent um, other ag issue groups, and they represent the multinationals like Corteva and Bayer and, and uh, Syngenta and others. So it's, you know, I don't think anyone can say with all that discussion, all that rhetoric, all that lobbying, that one party or the other uh, is better for agriculture, with the exception, perhaps you can expect more attempt at regulation on environmental issues in particular from the Democratic Party. But the, the discourse that goes on is intense and meaningful and, and uh, buffers a lot of what some people might expect. So just an observation that I hope made sense. Johnny. Johnny, you've got a question. Hey, I'll, thanks very much uh, to all the speakers. I'll try and save us and um, pull us out of the politics uh, <laughs> chat. But um, so Archie, I'll draw back to you and um, that journey to um, almost specialization and, and building it uh, outside of commodity. Um, often, like I remember we actually at our CSC, we had a uh, economist talk to us and said, uh, being in the commodity game actually draws upon the bigger pool of people. Um, so I wondered in that journey into um, drawing out of a commodity, how, how have you kept efficiency and uh, ensured that you've still got a big market pool to, um, to sell your products? So I guess our, we've kept in that efficiency is, is we have tried to implement new things every so often. We don't try and jump and be radical. Um, try and move slowly and and try an idea and make sure that there's a, a market there before we actually move forward. Uh, make sure that there's a demand there. Um, it's almost kind of, it's a mix between making sure that demand is there, but almost on a sense of that, that old saying of build it and they, and they will come. Um, if, if you don't, it's, it's one of those risks. You have to take, you have to take the risk and jump out there and build something. And hopefully they will come, but, but you have to analyze your situation, not only analyzing, you know, your farm and your, the people's demands, but analyze, um, your neighborhoods. Are you in close proximity to a large amount of people? Um, what is the general uh, trends of people? Are they trending more towards organic or non-organic? Or that, do they want produce year round? Um, and it's, I'm not gonna lie, it's been a extreme undertaking and uh, it's something that I did not really foresee. Um, and my, my frazzledness is, is taken over at times and my ADHD is just continue to skyrocket. Um, as you could tell in my presentation, I was bouncing all over the wall and in my mind, it makes sense. Um, but sometimes when I'm talking to people, it's, it's, uh, it, it doesn't come out right, but I guess it's just, you know, taking time and analyzing situations, don't jump to conclusions. Um, and that, that goes to say for, for all, all farms, um, in all industries, you can't jump into conclusions and, and make a decision off of a whim. Um, they always say, you know, assuming one things, well, assume just stands for making an ass out of you and me. So. Fantastic. And be careful what Facebook says. <laughs> yes, yes. We have time for probably one more question. Do we have any other burning questions before we close for this evening, this morning? No? 
not seeing any hands raised. So with that, I would just like to say uh, a big thank you to our three speakers today, John Chandler, Archie Griffin, and Ed Key. Um, Ed, confusingly, his name is Walter, but we all know him as Ed. So thank you very much to our three speakers. It was really um, great to see some, some um, you know, in the short space of time that we have some, some meaty content about um, the issues that have been faced in California. And uh, Archie, I think you've done some um, really wide reading there with some some models that you've been able to apply to your farm. So yeah, really interesting stuff. And I've taken some notes and I'm sure some of the other participants have as well. So thanks for answering the um, questions in the chat as we've gone along. That's really appreciated and makes it uh, run quite smoothly. So um, with that, I'll close for today. Just a reminder before we go that our next webinar is actually a series of five days in a row that I've been looking forward to all year, actually. It's taken a lot to get it together. And of course, COVID has been delaying it because we are planning um, a week of uh, virtual GFP visits uh, in Kenya. So COVID situation in Kenya, like in a lot of places, has been up and down, but, but we think we're right to go. So we have um, one hour a day, every day for five days at the end of November. So 23rd to the 27th of November. It will be back in the evening time for Australia, which is mid-morning for Kenya. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's probably the middle of the night for Canada and the US. I'm sorry about that, but we will be um, making the video available to our, to our scholars only. It won't be public um, because we are trying to do it um, like a GFP. On a GFP, you often get down to, to quite um, technical and... Um, Person, well, what's the word? Personal details about a farm and their finances. So um, we won't be making the, the videos public at this stage. Certainly not the wrap up video on the last on the last day on Friday, the twenty seventh. So those videos are being um, organised now. So we'll have some video content and some live content by our uh, GFP host. Our general host in Kenya is Sarah Flowers, who works for um, Kakuzi, which is a big. Um, agricultural company over there specializing mostly in avocados but in other tree crops as well and also by Stuart Barden who's a 2009 Australian Nuffield scholar who now lives and works in Kenya and has a dairy farm there so they're two of the businesses that we'll be looking at um, and more details will be shared with you before the 23rd of November so um, moving back to today as I said I'd like to thank our present presenters very much for today and I'd like to thank our participants for listening and actively being involved as well. So have a good day everyone, good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.